Hello, a uh, very warm welcome for our today's webinar uh, to talk about Scandinavia and Finland. We are very happy to have you all here today. Um, my name is Françoise Claire, I'm head of classical music at the Centre National de la Musique, and uh, Eric Denut on my right hand side is going to lead the discussion. We have, as usual, uh, a very prestigious and amazing um, group of guests today coming from uh, the Nordic countries. It's, it's a, a great pleasure to have this discussion about this area of the world, which is the world in itself in music. Um, it's, it's a world in itself, but it's also very open to the rest of the world with some great, some of the greatest uh, composers uh, uh, in the historical music, and but also um, very active in the contemporary music um, world. So I hope you will enjoy the discussion. And uh, I pass the lead to Eric to manage to lead this discussion. So thank you very much for being with us and see you soon again. Thanks so much, Francois, for those kind words. And thanks so much to all the participants of today's panel discussion. I will immediately introduce you um, to them, and we are looking forward to hearing their thoughts indeed on the, this uh, fascinating part of the world, which is uh, Scandinavia in our uh, marketed industry. Let me start with the ladies, perhaps, with Tatiana. Tatiana Kendler is the uh, head of artistic planning at the Danish radio in Copenhagen. A warm welcome to Tatiana. I follow up with Marion. Marion S. Holm is journalist, author, musicologist. She is hosting a contemporary music show in Oslo at the Norwegian um, state broadcasting radio called NOK Culture. Um, it's a great pleasure having you on board, Marion. Thanks so much. I um, Where should I go? I should go eastwards a little bit. So let's go to Stockholm with Frederick Anderson. Frederick is the uh, program director at the most famous concert ha house. I don't know how to pronounce it in Swedish, but I won't. In Stockholm, it is a great honor, great pleasure having you. You must be also very, very busy like all of you. So we very much appreciate. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, let's go farther east, even if I'm not sure is right now in Scandinavia, maybe like us in one of those Western metropolis in Europe, um, a little bit farther from um, the actual events. Uh, Topi Letipu, uh, how can I introduce Topi? Topi was formerly the head of the much famous world-renowned Helsinki Festival. He is also a world-famous tenor a singer, and he is also a producer and curator. Thanks so much, Topi. I know how tight is your time schedule, so we also very appreciate having you. Um, I go back westwards from Finland, back to uh, uh, Copenhagen and Denmark um, with uh, Andrew. Andrew Miller is author, journalist, uh, of the musicologist and critic in uh, quite famous, um, very famous magazines. He has been authoring us a couple of books on our subject. It is a real pleasure having you, I mean, me introducing also your thoughts and reflection on, Nordic, on the Nordic scene for a continental European. Thanks so much, Andrew. And I stay in Copenhagen with, uh, oh, please apologize my pronunciation of Danish, so Nikolai. You will tell me about your, your search name, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't dare. Uh, who is the managing director of the Concerto Copenhagen? We're famous early music and Baroque music uh, uh, ensemble uh, based in, in Denmark. We are so very, very proud having you and hearing about uh, that mythical scene on uh, Baroque intention music in, uh, in, in Scandinavia. So, First of all, I will um, ask each of you, one after the other, what happened in the last two, three years in, uh, in Scandinavia. You have been hit like all Europe uh, by COVID, uh, various uh, phases and, and cycles. 
Um, so may I ask each of you how your activity has been impacted and how you see the common season and year going on? Uh, maybe let's do the, some, the same circle and let's start with Tatiana in Copenhagen. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Well, it's a big question, of course. Uh, first of all, just to introduce the the band, uh, the Symphony Orchestra is part of the of the Danish uh, radio uh, and television. So, of course, a media orchestra first and foremost. So, in that sense, of course, we were, as everybody, utterly hit by by the pandemic, but had uh, always the open microphone and also the uh, the uh, sort of the pledge to, to keep the music alive on radio. So every Thursday we have a, a traditional Thursday concert, which is live broadcast on our serious music channel. And uh, this of course went on, even though there were no audience allowed. The, of course, the first, when it hit in March, 2020, everything was closed down, the whole, the whole society uh, closed down and, and we, we, uh, we sent the orchestra at home. But very, very soon, I think almost four weeks after we started with the first concerts, which was and then only because we have a, uh, a limit of 10 people gathering together. So we could do up to quintet. Uh, and if we managed it carefully and made sure people didn't meet, we could be even seven people uh, variously on stage, uh, which of course meant there was no backstage. Um, I was producer and, uh, and technician and everything. And then of course we have our radio techniques. So we very soon managed to have live concerts again, which was wonderful. Uh, I love chamber music. So for me, it was a hoot uh, for the orchestra members who, who would do a lot of chamber music in their, in their spare time outside the orchestra. Of course, it was also wonderful to, to be able to flex that muscle, muscle as well. So we had uh, we had we did some great programming. I think we had some 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 great fun, and and very soon uh, the orchestra was able to come back again in small in smaller sections. We were up to fifty, and uh, and then gradually back in 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 August we were allowed to be full scale again. I mean this is August uh, um, twenty we're talking about, and we had. Um, at that time, we opened. Uh, we were supposed to open with the Mahler Second Symphony, which I would just have to say. I mean, if you have dreamt this up, uh, of course it was planned two two years uh, ahead of this time. But but it was it just it just hit smash it down in what the audience wanted at that time. And we had three concerts; they were totally sold out. I mean, you can. I, I'm sitting in uh, in front of a screen of our hall. It's a big hall. We have 1,800 seats. Um, and then, of course, with the restrictions, which were at that time, we were only allowed to be 500, including the performance. And you can imagine for a mile a second, it meant that we <laughs> had to say, to say goodbye to quite a lot of audiences. Um, but still, it, it, the, the, the sentiment in the audience at that time, and of course also with the musicians, this feeling that this was, this was just a symphony to start with. And to, to um, relate all our feelings, all our subdued feelings at this time, that there is a life, there is something that is greater than, than the daily uh, trivialities. And uh, it, it, was, it was just the perfect opening. And it, I think in a, in a way it set a mood also for, for a lot of, of what happened later on. Then we had to do one more close down for, for a short period, but, but still continued with the concerts, even again in, in very small scales. So we have been sort of on, on uh, like a harmonica, uh, uh, large and, and, and very small at, at different times. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't want to occupy all things. Uh, there were some learnings from it, but I think maybe this will be in, in the next question round, right, because of course we learned a lot from how to deal with our audience, how to, how to, um, how to use our media. Uh, which was what did work uh, when you're talking about streaming, what didn't work, and and so on. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect, me, perfect introduction into exactly <laughs> the challenges of the coming times. But right now, you unfold mm. a completely normal season. 
Yes. You, you may have the eighteen yeah. hundred people seats being okay. No so. restrictions left. That was that was uh, came very very soon. Um, so we are very happy about that. It, okay. it just it just means so much to the musicians and to the audience as well. I mean, sitting two hundred thirty people in a, in a hall this size with an orchestra and choir that was even bigger. I mean, they really had to applaud very very loud. You could see the physically how much they tried to make it sound as if they were eighteen hundred. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, super. Thank you. So we come we come back later on the challenges and being, of course, and the framework of a radio means also a lot in the 21st century. May I, may we go to to Oslo and Norway? So seen, seen from Paris, London, Berlin, Norway is home to most famous musicians. I mean, from the past, Greek, etc. Also from the present, rules, Miracle, Olive, Over, Anthony's, etc. So, how did the uh, Norwegian Radio Cup with that COVID situation in spring 2020, and since then, how would you judge now the status of the Norwegian music scene uh, in 2022, Marie? Well, it's it's coming back to normal now so uh, and uh, yeah well i'm actually based in bergen which is the, the hometown even of uh, gig and leif uvansnes so yeah uh, but i'm working for uh, the norwegian broadcasting in in oslo though uh, so we had also lots of cancellations and online concerts and uh, empty uh, <laughs> empty concert uh, venues but but yeah, well, the, the Bergen Philharmonic uh, have been playing more or less uh, throughout these two years, uh, also, yeah, streaming their concerts. And and I think also the Oslo Philharmonic has been doing that. Um, yeah, but of course, for the freelance musicians, it's much more insecure and uh, they have to be on guard all the time if, if things are being, uh, yeah, postponed or cancelled and... Uh, for the festivals, the Borealis Festival that goes on here in March every year, uh, we had, um, yeah, well, the first year it was like, yeah, we, we, we may managed to make a, a festival somehow, and, and everybody had this kind of uh, adrenaline <laughs> uh, with uh, coping somehow, but, and then the next year it was more like, well, tired, tired, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so it's been a, it's been really draining in the long run this this uh, pandemic, uh, and yeah, well, of course we have had to discover more local artists because we couldn't fly in uh, the big stars, and uh, the local artists have been working a lot, and uh, yeah, but of course we we get. <clears throat> Maybe if there is uh, something to say about the, the, the effect of this, maybe it has been a, a bit more, uh, well, less diverse, if I may say. So it's it's the, <clears throat> the, the people that are most commonly asked and, and uh, yeah, that, that can do things in, in a short notice. They have been working a lot and we have had to... Uh, make other sacrifices <laughs> so uh, yeah but and also uh we of course wonder if if the audience will be coming back to the concert halls now or if they've gotten used to sitting at home and well not moving <laughs> too much so yeah we, we don't know quite yet but uh for the concerts that have been lately there has been uh yeah full uh full house and yeah good atmosphere so yeah we're we're getting back i think wonderful maybe we come back later to that idea of discovering more local artists and uh, how it was uh, becoming more important than ever having that kind of intimate link between audiences and artists and to to to, to stay on the same page um, i think people living in vienna for instance or munich can be jealous of bergen if they ever discover it i mean the first time i was there I was just amazed. Everyone was telling me, oh, but look, this is the place where Ernstness is living. Oh, look, this is where what we has been growing, etc. And all these places are like 300 meters, I mean, on a hill or, or oh, this is the boat of, of, you know, so, and it's yeah. definitely the feeling you only have in, 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 in normally in German speaking countries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like yeah well, I'm, such, I'm, such I'm, cities. 
I'm living very close to Jake's uh, cabin. Yeah, but that, that's typical yeah. of Bergen. I mean, yeah, everyone's yeah. Like, <laughs> having... It's very uh, concentrated. Greek's yeah. grandchildren as, as neighbors. Yeah, um, but it's a very impressive, I must say, and, and, and a very beautiful city. And also very anecdotal, but that's the most silenced railway station I ever experienced in my life. Um, as big as the French or London ones, but silent with people inside. Um, Frederick, um, audience participation, uh, local artists not being able to invite um, touring orchestras, but still having, I mean, worldwide artists, don't, I don't need to name them. In Stockholm, pretty much the valet of uh, Europe, uh, I don't need also to mention Spotify being born there. So how is the status now in February 22 in Stockholm? Well, um, I can say I have, we have the similar experience like uh, Copenhagen and, and Bergen, Norway. Uh, I don't need to, to, to tell all about that. We started also streaming uh, in April 2020 immediately. But what, what, what is uh, peculiar with our city is that we have a lot of world-class uh, performers living in Stockholm. And uh, so we, we had to, to go local as everyone else. And local for us meant Nina Stemme, Peter Matei, Janine Janssen, who lives in our town, Alan Gilbert, who conducted several weeks uh, during the pandemic, Martin Frost, all these people. Uh, I mean, they're... they're their gigs, their jobs were cancelled as well as uh, all over the world. So they had to stay at home and we were playing with our orchestra. So we asked them, why can't you come to us and do it? And they said, of course, <laughs> we'd love to. So we had, a, we had actually, everything is still up on, the, on our website, all these uh, films, all these concerts from the pandemic. And it's, it's world-class performance by world-class performers. And we're just so lucky with that. We, we I mean, the pandemic is, uh, is, of course, something that we never want to see back again. But, but we also learned a lot from this. And, and uh, we learned especially to be flexible, I think, which, which is not perhaps the most common word when you talk about classical music business. But we, we really learned how to, to much faster change uh, programming and, uh, and the situation for, for the musicians. Uh, instead of playing with a big orchestra of 80, 90, 100 musicians on a smaller or ordinary stage, we, we played with the 60, 65 musicians on an extended stage and uh, played some music that we perhaps uh, not always play. It's more for the chamber orchestras to play, play some of the pieces we played. But that was also crucial for the musicians to, to expand and extend their, their repertoire and, and discover things from that perspective so uh, but now we are back uh, in uh, in so to say normal mood we we actually gambled our institution we gambled uh, last summer and started selling subscriptions for this season and we sold about 8200 subscriptions and uh, sweden opened up in in late september and uh, so we, we gained a lot from that. We had a, um, a minor close down now for January and half of February, but now all restrictions are taken away. And um, we see that we have a, a, a lot of audience still out there. Uh, I know it people back, but I also think that during the pandemic and with the live streaming, we have found new audience because we see quite a lot of new young people sitting on our chorus balcony that we haven't seen before and that's uh, that's really exciting i think so i understand that some elderly people perhaps don't want to go out and sit in a in a large crowd anymore uh, but uh, but so on the other hand we have found perhaps someone else who come and take their place so we'll see what the future has but now as it is now uh, we are in normal mood and we are happy for that Good, good. That sounds pretty good. Um, must say that's a quite a long time now. Two, 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 two years we are having this show. Thanks to the Centre National de Musique and Françoise Claire, and this is probably one of the most optimistic saying we heard. 
<laughs> so we are we are we are happy to hear that and all the more from a, such a, a privileged and strategic place like like stockholm um may, 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 may we go further east or topi you you are in the also quite privileged situation of having kind of like to have you being prison and active in at least two continents and one island the island being the united kingdom um so finland is also per se kind of island um so to say that finland um equals in some way classical music in the world wouldn't be an overstatement i think since from paris for instance the most famous composer living in paris or one of the most famous is a finnish one the most important conductor or one of the most famous i don't want to make enemies in in town but is orchestra de paris mr klaus makela i was talking about kaya Sariao before and 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 okay so that means finland is much more than finland in classical music so um what are the um feedbacks you heard or you experienced uh from these two last years in helsinki and other major towns in finland Topi, before we come later to what it means being a fan in the classical music but let's um, first focus on that thanks yeah first of all uh, very nice to meet you all uh it's uh we are very much in the same boat as Nordic countries. That's one thing. And then we have, of course, very dear kind of um, um, rivalities, very friendly rivalities between each other also. Uh, we can come back to that. So we have some nice, nice memories with Frederick, especially on that field, uh, um, Finland between uh, Sweden. Anyway, um, um, first of all, it's, uh, it's kind of funny that I'm representing Finland here being a, being a North Londoner since last three years and having been living in France uh, 15 years before that. But, uh, but nevertheless, or I excuse uh, to all my Finnish colleagues to, to present with a, maybe a little bit less of gravitas being little, uh, maybe too international for that, for that role. Anyway, so last two years, Finland, very much the same situation is in the classical field as, as in, uh, in, uh, in your uh, respective institutions. Um, I checked a little bit the, the statistics of, of the amount of symphony orchestra visitors. Um, the comparison between 19 and 20 was that there were maybe third of the live audiences year 10, 20. So nine years was more or less, uh, nine months of the 12 months were more or less locked down or limited audiences. So that corresponds. <laughs> um, the, the streaming um, audience was also around the third or 25% of the, of, the, uh, of the year 90. Um, one, uh, so I, I won't repeat it's similar kind of feelings in Finland in general for the classical music field and symphony orchestras. I'd just like to add Marian open to a little bit more the kind of bigger, bigger scene and the bigger discourse of the classical music, whatever, whatever it is. Um, uh, also the schools and the education of classical music uh, that has been, of course, hampered, battered by the pandemic. However, many, very often the private, private tuition could continue online or live. Um, a big, uh, big issue, of course, has been the, the higher education of classical music. Uh, they have kind of survived uh, through thanks to online teaching, but there is a there's a maybe the biggest impact of this pandemic period has been the, the the influence on younger people who are talented and are thinking about shall I become a classical musician in my life or not? And uh, I have in my vicinity uh, examples of that that people didn't choose classical music because the, because of the times. So the, this is uh, this is one one kind of uh, long term effect. I hope it's not not too big. Um, so, uh, and I think it's, I'm not only speaking about Finland when I say that, that this, that the whole discourse should be kind of um, um, uh, regarded and kind of observed what has happened and how we can help these different parts, parts of the whole classical music discourse. Um, otherwise, um, uh, uh, please, Eric, back to you. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's great. So uh, uh, about uh, friendly rivalities, Please let us uh, know if the Finnish army in, in, intends to invade Sweden during our show. <laughs> we'll be happy to transmit it. Um, uh, and apropos also uh, Finns being uh, 
uh, other things um, having been um, in, invited we had already for instance Risto Niminen on our show uh, we also had uh, many uh, uh, promoters or some of the most famous Icelandic promoters live in Canada now again in uh, in Sweden the uh, Anna Inaslotia also on the show um, may I go to to Andrew Andrew maybe um, seen from uh, a, a British Danish perspective, how would you judge how the Scandinavian on the Nordic scene did cope with uh, COVID regarding to other countries you may have observed, um, Great Britain or, or, or Germany? Yeah, well, I mean, um, in a sense, as a journalist, it was my job to put all this in perspective, and I do a lot of reporting in Britain and America, and um, I think the stability that is at the heart of the Nordic region's kind of classical music life uh, paid off. And that, that stability is not always a good thing, I think. It, it's, it's the great characteristic of Nordic music, this incredible network of orchestras, um, a, 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 an unrivaled um, architectural um, infrastructure in terms of concert halls and opera houses and um, um, orchestras that are, that are almost fully funded, you know, up to 85% of their costs met by the state. This is something that's alien uh, in my home country of Britain and is even more of, of a remote concept in America. So I think that that, um, that sort of proved its merit uh, during the pandemic. We saw orchestras um, who were completely wrong footed um, artistically by the change and had no idea how to respond. We saw orchestras who did their very best to respond um, an orchestra in Olborg, a northern city here in Denmark, which immediately climbed aboard a bus and started visiting um, hospitals, old people's homes, schools. Um, and that was an example of how, you know, orchestras can take the initiative. But a lot of Nordic orchestras, as much as I love them, have, have been so comfortable for so long that there's not a lot of initiative taken. Um, it was great that uh, here in Copenhagen, we had concerts happening so quickly. Tatiana has explained her orchestra was, you know, having, having Mahler's Second Symphony played in, in September, 2020 was just one of the most extraordinary things you could experience after the previous six months. Uh, the opera here in Copenhagen was the first to unite chorus, orchestra and audience for a performance in the whole of Europe, I believe. Um, but um, on the other hand, I'm sure Nikolai would add to this that the, the, the big divide was between freelance musicians and musicians who enjoy a salary. Um, if you're paid a salary every month by, uh, by your symphony orchestra or your opera orchestra, then you were okay. If you're an early musician and early musicians are forced by the nature of the work they do to be freelance, which seems to be quite unfair in the first place, um, it was a different story. Um, and I think also, uh, as top people know in London, you know, you have standing symphony orchestras with, with civic reputations that are effectively freelance bands. Um, LSO, Philharmonia, LPO, these are freelance organizations. And um, that was where my previous life was. And it was very interesting to see colleagues of mine um, who were left with nothing having uh, uh, even if they sit in principal chairs in London in London symphony orchestras so I think the stability that um, that the Nordic region has in its in its kind of corner paid off and I, and I do think that stability is a wonderful thing in many ways it makes uh, classical music if that's what we're talking about here open accessible um, the architectural revolution uh, Helsinki's Musica Talo, the, the DR Concert Hall, the Oslo Opera House, these buildings have transformed the way populaces interact with classical music. Um, and um, just to add to Topi's statistics there, you know, until the pandemic, the Musica Talo in Helsinki was pretty much selling out every concert. That was never the case um, when, the, when, when concerts took place at the Finlandia Hall. Um, and similarly, Tatiana's orchestra has grown a completely uh, new fresh audience in the last decade since that concert, beautiful concert hall was opened. So yeah, I, I would say that always in Scandinavia, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of stability versus the sort of hot footed, unstable innovation that you get in a city like Berlin and London. And um, yeah, there's good things to both. And I wouldn't be living in Copenhagen if I didn't think that uh, there was very, very, um, there were positive things to be brought from that sense of stability. Thanks so much. I'm now very scared how this panel may unfold after such wise and reasonable and uh, important uh, thoughts already expressed in the first 30 minutes of the show. Um, okay, so I do my best to 
to push it even forward. But that was really brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much, all of you. So perfect transition to Nikolai. Nikolai, you have this difficult position here to represent the free artists, the free ensembles, and also the artists themselves. Um, so I'm sure the Danish state or the Danish public bodies did take some measures or initiatives in some way to help, or I'm mistaken, tell me. Yes, we, we Concerto Copenhagen is an independent or orchestra like uh, all Baroque orchestras, practically like Andrew just said. Our musicians are, are freelance musicians and um, we don't have our own hall like, like the radio orchestras. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, we have always had to face the 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 challenge of making ourselves um, uh, necessary to audience and society. So uh, it, it's a it's a reality we are living all the time, um, like like Andrew also mentioned. So uh, the the pandemic was certainly a very tough challenge to, to uh, orchestras that uh, basically exist to make live concerts of all kinds. But I think um, as I have seen it both from our own organization and some of our sister organizations, we were also very agile to react and uh, in think of other ways of communicating the music. What we could not do, uh, like symphony orchestras, was to stream uh, concerts because we, precisely because we don't have a hall. Um, and actually we decided uh, to not do that because we did not really believe in the, co in the uh, importance of a stream concert without an audience. So we tried, and I know some of our colleague orchestras also try to invent other formats that are on the, you know, on the condition of the digital format. If you want to make a music video, make it on the on the uh, the virtues of the digital format. L let's make something out of it that is digital and not pretend that we can present a live concert in any decent way through a digital channel. At least that was, that was our choice. Um, but our musicians, they were really in tough conditions. And the, the truth is that uh, for a very long time, there was not anything, any help for them from the state, uh, Eric, actually. It did change over time because uh, the government discovered that they had completely lost um, a, a big part of the artists, not only musicians, but many other ones. And then also not to forget that we employ musicians from many different countries. It, uh, Concerto Copenhagen is very international, so uh, each country had its own, um, you know, help packages for its musicians. And for example, I know that in Sweden, the 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 Musicians Association very soon opened up for new memberships without any conditions. So uh, a musician who wasn't a member could immediately uh, go in and also get the support. And that, for example, was a, a, a great gesture. Uh, in, de in Denmark, the, uh, the help uh, changed over time. So some of our musicians could actually get some help. But what we did is that together with our friends association and a few uh, donors, we were able to put some money at disposal for those musicians who were in the worst conditions. We made simply a survey among our 70 freelance musicians and the there were 13 of those who were in so bad conditions that that even you know even a thousand euros was a help for them. We did that in 2020, and when I saw these figures that we got back, it was all anonymous, of course. I was shocked how, what, what conditions those world-class musicians are living on. It, it's so different from somebody who is having a steady workplace in in a symphony orchestra, you know. So it has it has been tough, but 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 I think it has the challenge uh, that we have learned from is to simply reinvent ourselves and our raison d'être, and that has been very interesting. We we have results of the pandemic that we definitely pursue, and we will not um, give in on on things just because we can play live concerts now. So it has also been very interesting.
But your season now is getting back to normal. So you are having concerts yes, locally you know, and some tours. Yes, exactly. But it's still obvious that uh, many things have changed. Uh, we even uh, last month we had concerts cancelled. So okay. it's 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 still there, and many. Um, uh, actually, we are going to play for uh, in in Fredex concert hall uh, later this year, and that is a concert that has been postponed two times, I think, because Fredex simply had to reshuffle his program completely, and that is that is still happening. There is another uncertainty and a more short-term planning, uh, but we are mainly dependent on organizers and promoters. We only organize between four and five concerts ourselves in Copenhagen okay. each year. So, yeah. And digital formats you were mention, mentioning or kind of short video clips or what are they exactly? Yes, we we have we have worked with some different formats. We we exactly some some short formats of two, three, four minutes with our musicians working with uh, making music in in on traditional conditions. We we um have been working quite some years now with the, the music video, but a classical music video that is not filming the musicians, but actually like, you know, a pop or rock group that will make a stunning visual uh, presentation with some music track underneath that we think is very interesting. We, we have made some attempts at that that I'm very satisfied with. Um, we have um, worked on... Um, yeah, this combination of uh, the visual attraction being being the main selling point and the music, it's actually in a way secondary, but, but we believe we're also reaching other kinds of audience uh, doing that, you know. And then, of course, making uh, plain recording, CD, album recordings, that is also something. Thanks, thanks so much for this explanation. So let, let, let's come maybe to a few points you have uh, all of you mentioned. So seen from London, Paris, Berlin again, um, Nordic countries seem kind of uh, Nordic Valley. So, you know, like the Silicon one. So exporting is best goods and services and, and people. So like Danish composers or Finnish composers, Finnish conductors, um, Norwegian cello players or Swedish clarinet ones. You see what I mean? So it cannot be chance. It cannot be aleatory or hazard. There is some system behind this. So the way, let's, let's try to dive a bit deeper on this. So um, we heard even from London and Paris about the fantastic school system um, in Finland. We heard about the great ecosystem of new halls etc all around we heard about the 60 plus symphonic orchestras for quite a small population i mean andrew as we were preparing the show you told me this is 25 million inhabitants so i didn't count again but that must be so that means a uh, scene from or scandinavia so that means this is even a higher rate as in german-speaking countries uh, and much higher than in the uk france italy or spain of course so this is really massive so um, I don't know, seen from your institutions or your point of view, what explains or which are the, let's say, two, three main factors which explain this kind of very sane and healthy ecosystem? So we start again with you, Tatiana, and Copenhagen. And maybe the really important thing or good thing for even French speakers here is that Tatiana has got a hall also having been designed by Mr. Nouvelle. So you can definitely compare these two <laughs> ecosystems. Well, I think it's it's a very um, it's a very soul searching uh, question you are you are, you are, you are, you are you're putting forward here. Um, what is the basic for how we succeed to to get in touch with our audience and seem relevant? Is is that is that what you are? What you're aiming oh, at? Oh, it's a global ecosystem. It seems to function from the very early childhood where people get learning some instruments up to being virtuals, up to your audience members, which 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 which, which come massively to the whole and listening. And even young or new audience, as Friedrich was saying after the yeah. lockdowns. Sure, I think I think it's very much that we 
you spend so enormous amount of our time. Uh, and now I'm talking on behalf of all the ensembles within the within the radio, but I think it it also goes for for um, for most of, of uh, all of our colleagues in in, in Denmark at least. Uh, it's so important for us to to connect with our audience, to uh, to to be relevant for them, and also to talk with them about classical music being not a question of learning the etiquette. Uh, of being in a special social environment, uh, but that classical music really has something to to uh, to tell you about yourself and about the the world that you are living in. And I think also by by keeping, and of course, we all know it's it's not it's not easy to insist that contemporary music has to play a big part in in our in our programming. But I think it's such an important part of it, and of course, uh, being a, a public service station for us, it's it's uh, it's it's really something that we feel very very strongly that we that we if we don't do it, who else should be able to do it? Because we have so many resources in this. Um, so all the time, keeping up with with our contemporary composers, with Hans Abrahamsen and and uh, of course a lot of of, of also from the younger uh, composers. It's just very important for us. And I think, of course, it's not what makes us popular, meaning, I mean, in a broader sense, but it's something that keeps us relevant, I think, for quite a lot of people. And then there's also something about money, of course. You need you need to make sure that you have the uh, tickets that are easily uh, available and, and payable for, 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 especially for young people, the students and, 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 and so on. I mean, for us, it's 50% off. Of, uh, of the ticket if you're under 30. So, and then also, and I think that is something at least we've really learned from, from this uh, from this pandemic time, uh, how to connect with people on the media. Because of course, I mean, it's such a privilege uh, uh, to, to be from a media institution uh, and we have a lot of resources to, and, and knowledge to, to draw from, but still we really learned a lot during this how to communicate with our audience, but also how to, how should I put it, mm, connect the dots, so to speak. So, so what, what went on on Flow Radio, Flow TV was used again in, on, the, on the social media. Um, we could see that and, and, and we, we, we also had a lot of news mails to, to our audiences. I think during the first lockdown, which was uh, two or three months, we poured out 650,000 emails uh, uh, and with an opening rate of about 75%. So we really engaged with, with, with people at, at that time. And everything, once we sort of got the nag of it, everything was, was committed to uh, make them uh, push the play button uh, on one of the medias or, or be in contact with us. Either it should be short or it should be longer. So I think that was a very important part of really learning how to communicate. But but of course it goes longer back than that. And and, and all what I'm doing here is is very much working on through the programming to build up a loyalty uh, in our audience that they that they know that when they are invited into into our concert series, and of course that goes also for for the for the choirs um, and for the big band, they sort of are bond between us and we know that there's a uh, there are certain things they expect from us and uh, and that we are very sure to to deliver that one thing is to be very diverse um of course classical music uh, you can discuss uh, the possibilities within that and and honestly i mean and that was i loved when the time when we had chamber music we could be uh, we could be so swift and we could we could have I mean, one of the one of the concerts was uh, Pierre Laurent He was supposed to be soloist for the Ravel uh, uh, Left Hand Piano Concerto, but instead he played 60 minutes of only Kurtag solo, uh, which was just a treat and some things you could do because you could you were able to to work on on short terms and, and just for the open mics. Um, yeah, but still, but still, we try to make sure that that the season program. Uh, has a lot of interest for a lot of different kind of, of people and, and, and different ways of communicating the, the music. Sometimes it's, it's uh, film music not meant as a classical uh, turn on, but, but still something that will connect people with the sound of classical music. 
and then with a lot of really good uh, light uh, and and scenography, which I really would like to incorporate in our, our upcoming classical concerts. Um, we really need an update on that and to look a little better. So, so being through the programming, uh, communicating with our audience uh, through the through the uh, through the media's, uh, making sure that we not one media stands alone, but that everything is is connected into each other. I think that's that's one of the and and very much have a high quality on on the production. I so agree with what you say, Nikolai. Uh, just to film a concert and and believe that uh, that it's that will make it is uh, I think it's only half the story. And what we learned, which I think was was amazing, um, because we have a very high production value when we do television, really uh, fantastic camera uh, doings and producing and always five cameras and things like that. But now we learn to use our robot cameras. You cannot, you cannot put robot cameras together with ordinary uh, quality cameras because it's, it, you can simply see when, when it's what. But we made one production of um, a new harp concerto, which we first performed uh, uh, by the Danish young composer Martin Stauning. It's on YouTube. Um, it's it's about thirty minutes long. It has had to reach now over twenty thousand people, which I mean, or, or clicks, which I think for a contemporary harp concerto, and it's 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 not easy listening, but it's beautiful. Uh, that's that's quite that's quite uh, an achievement. And we learned to do this by using the robot cameras uh, in a split screen, so so it looks fantastic. It sounds amazing. Um, it's really well played, and I think that it was for me. It was such an encouragement to see that that what I mean we it should have been on a live concert, but we had to cancel it uh, and did this uh, production instead. And we would have what how much six hundred a thousand people in the hall uh, to listen to it, and now it has reached over twenty thousand people. And I think that's that's a good lesson for how we can how we can use this to if we do it clever then we can use it really good. Oh, mm. fabulous. And also the, the number, the figure you, you told about with this 75% clicking rate on the newsletter, that's, that's, that's impressive, I must yes. say. That's, uh, yeah, but that's, we were also, that's why I'm so wow. So it, it was a, 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 a tutorial on <laughs> YouTube. We, we asked you later to do that. Yeah. I know some of your colleagues somewhere the continent would be happy to know how to do that. Thanks, thanks so much. It was really, really, really nice having all these bullet points and great, great. Um, uh, shall, shall we go to Bergen? Um, um, Marion, so these um, Bergen ecosystem is, of course, uh, nothing to be uh, translated anywhere much, probably, but at least uh, having a new opera house like the one in Oslo, having fantastic philharmonies and, 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 and symphonic orchestras, like it's the case in all around Norway, having this this very famous uh, festival, Borelli, but also Bergen Intentional, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is this is something also which builds something like a system. So how would you explain it in a also in a couple of bullet uh, points? What is the most uh, relevant from in your opinion? Yeah, well, if you uh, well, I understood your your initial question a bit like. Well, what is the success of the Nordic model? Absolutely. Yeah, what the, of the, the, the receipts. The well, receipts. Yeah. Yeah, the Recipe. Yes. Yeah. Well, I. Um, hmm. It's probably a combination of uh, a lot of uh, state financing and uh, Norway being repulsively rich. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, but it's uh, but it's also a very egalitarian society. We have this uh, well, a cultural school, a cultural school for the kids uh, that give uh, 20 minutes uh, lessons to to everyone who wants and it's uh it's at very low cost so it's um yeah well i i guess this is uh, also helping uh not reproducing class differences uh but of course there are some patterns still persisting um for example, well, rich kids play string instruments and, and, and poor kids play brass instruments. Yeah, well, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and well, I am interviewing a lot of composers and freelance musicians working in the contemporary field. So it's, uh, 
Christian Lindbergh is the uh, most famous trombone player, so he's not from Norway, I know, but but still, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the, I, I, I'm, I'm kidding, Joke. but you, Joke. you get the point, right? It's a working class uh, tradition being a brass player, yeah. So yeah, um, uh, yeah, I interview a lot of composers, and I, my impression is that they, it's Norway is a good country for being a composer. I mean, they, they seem to cope very well, although they don't have necessarily to, well, they, even composers who don't write for orchestras or just write for smaller ensembles, they they are, uh, somehow manage to finance uh, uh, projects. Uh, they apply to the Cultural Council, I guess, for project uh, support. And, uh, and also during the pandemic, there were um, arrangements uh, for uh, compensation of, of lost uh, income. And, and even though it was a bit difficult to apply and uh, many people had to really work hard to, to figure out the rules for how to get this compensation, then I think, yeah, well, it helped a lot for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, and and then we have this question of well, if the state is financing art and music, uh, do they also um, put in conditions for how this art should be? And we have this uh, arm length principle, so the state is not supposed to be involved with uh, what kind of arts uh, we, we or they make, uh, but only. Uh, yeah, well, and now nowadays they have made this uh, report about diversity in the cultural area, and and um, yeah, well, examining how how the institutions are working to get a greater variety of people to work for them and with them, and yeah, and uh, this is has been discussed a lot, uh, uh, and many artists are critical because they say, well, we we don't want this interference or, or demands of uh, well our art should be well reflect diversity and and what about quality and all that but uh, in principle where the state is not supposed to interfere with uh, the the nature of art and music but only do the yeah well what, what people are allowed to make art and music so yeah an ongoing discussion nowadays here in in Norway and uh, but uh, yeah I, it, my impression is that it artists also working in more experimental fields uh, seem to manage quite well um, yeah well. thanks thanks so much Mike. it's good you may, you know, describing also the kind of uh, trade-off between um, all these highly societal and political issues like diversity, inclusion, etc., and and artistic freedom. We had a nice show with Barbara Hannigan, uh, George Lewis, uh, um, the agent of Alain Cribault, and many other um, great people um, a couple of months ago on this. And um, I mean, we, we try to show that this is not something which is a set of contradictory but there is indeed this tension, I think, in every, every country, even in regulation and law. Um, this is quite interesting you were mentioning it. Uh, I mean, um, Frederick, do, do you also observe in, in Sweden that kind of optimum between a stable, a stable uh, state and, and public uh, institution uh, support through uh, firm and uh, perennial long-term subsidies and a great great freedom while you are programming your season could you experience it yourself is that part of that uh, recipe to to success or are there many many more salt and pepper and and nutritive elements coming in the in the recipe I can almost uh, answer copy paste like Marion did uh, when it comes to the historic background and, and how things are built up in Sweden. It's the same as in Norway. And uh, I just want to add that I'm a poor trombone player myself. So, uh, 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 but I, I agree to that tradition. It's a working class tradition to be a, a brass musician, I think, uh, in many countries, not only Sweden and Norway. Uh, 
to answer your question, yes, we I think that the the solid um, subsidizing from from the state or the region or the cities uh, for for our arts form is of course it's fantastic to have uh, such a support. Uh, I have never felt myself in programming that it has been a burden that I need to do. I need to include certain things into the programming. But there are discussions in Sweden as well as, as I think in Norway uh, at the moment, at this very moment from, from the summer actually, uh, about uh, if the state or if the politicians are intruding too much in in uh, in the programming it's not only when it comes to music but it's theater and and arts and and everything it's this arm length distance that they should hold they should give the money to the to the culture but they should then keep away from from what's they should make the frame but they shouldn't say what should be in the frame uh, that's a discussion that that is going on i have never personally my, myself felt that it, that it has been a problem in 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 our orchestra and at the concert who's at stockholm we we tend to have a, as broad uh repertoire as possible from the very early music and inviting bands like concerto copenhagen when our orchestra don't play the baroque music as much as ourselves up to the absolute uh, newest of music the music that is written today and uh, we try to 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 be as diverse as possible in that sense. And we have also, since I started in 2015, uh, we have uh, been working really hard with trying to, to, to put a lot of more female composer, or women composer on the programs, and also to, to have an equal share of both uh, female soloists, as well as female conductors. Uh, on the podium. We are working very hard on, on this topic and uh, it's not that the politicians have said you have to do it, it's that we have felt ourselves that this is an important field, an important issue, something that we really should uh, should work hard with. And together with, with if you lift up the contemporary music uh, and, and, you, and you focus a lot on the contemporary music, that will sort of come by itself, because many of the today's great composers, as you know, as we have mentioned, one of them, but many of today's great composers are female. It's no big deal to put Unsok Chin or Sofia Gubaidulina or Kaya Saria who are on the program. They are the masters of today, no doubt about that. So um, I don't know if this is your is an answer to your question, but perfect. May I ask you? Um, which you 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 named you know Alan Gilbert, Nina Stemmer, Janine Janssen, all these people. We were not every one of us aware they are living in Sweden and Stockholm. Uh, what makes the city and not only Stockholm? We could also add Gothenburg uh, and Malmo. Those cities so attractive, in your opinion, for <laughs> let's say no, for let's say a very creative class to to. to, to when it comes I, want, to I want to be a little bit. Uh, I want to. Uh, entice you to a friendly rivality you know having people in Copenhagen, Bergen and Helsinki feeling a bit a bit jealous well it can't be because of the weather anyway I I mean it must be <laughs> when it comes to Alan Gilbert and Janine Janssen I know that it's for it's a uh, it's about love because they 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 are married to Swedish people uh, living in Stockholm and um which is a good reason. I mean, that's love, a, that's a love is not, good, not, not a bad reason, emotionally it's a speaking. Very good reason. Yeah. I think also that Stockholm, apart from being such a fantastic, beautiful city, which it is, uh, it's also a city where I think you can, I mean, it's, it's quite liberal. I think you can feel very much at home uh, being yourself. Uh, and express yourself in the way you want to, to express yourself. It's a little bit like a mini Berlin in, in that sense, I would say. Uh, but a beautiful city and um, I, I, actually the weather is quite okay. So um, there, there are many <laughs> options, but also we have, we have two, I must say, two very good orchestras, our orchestra and the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra and a, a, and a prominent opera house in the Royal Stockholm uh, Opera. And um, there are exciting things going on. Uh, in Stockholm, so I think it's a it's a good place to live if you're 
if you're into arts as well. Wonderful. Well, yeah. so good. Um, so um, in 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 Helsinki, what you don't have in Stockholm probably is that vibrant Japanese community you have in Helsinki. I mean, if you want to 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 feel like in Kyoto, I mean, Helsinki is a perfect place if you only want to to fly just three hours from Israel or from Charles de Gaulle or from Tegel. Um, um, please, uh, Topi, you said maybe one of the most important things which happened in the last two years were, were schools being closed up and having to, to, to have um, uh, accelerate on their digital change movement. Um, we all know about CBS Academy. You are yourself uh, been educated there and teaching there. So is that really key to the ecosystem? Does it explain Magnus Lindbergh, Isapi Kassalan and Klaus Michaela, Susan Omeniki, Kanya Sanyo, blah, 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 and Topi Letipu, or is there something else? Okay, so um, this is very much now a re response uh, to your earlier question about what's the Nordic recipe. And thinking here that our listeners might be mostly French music professionals, so I try to try to think my answer from that point of view. Maybe there are lots of admirable things in, in France. and uh, Continental Europeans. Okay, say. continental Europeans. Okay, very good. So um, uh, as, as Marion said, I think the reason for the Nordic success is, is the, the reasons are various. But I think there is, if you think of the, of, the, of the arc of life as a musician or as a classical music, uh, someone who has it, has it as a hobby, who, who listens to that, I think from the education point of view, uh, we all Nordic countries are quite organized. There is the ethos of excellence belongs to everybody, although we sometimes it means that uh, one should not be too, too more excellent than the other who is next to each other. Uh, the very social democratic idea, uh, the equality. Uh, uh, we are um, an organized means that that from the early age, you can have excellent uh, musical education from the age of babies. Uh, Helsinki Philharmonic Orchestra has done this uh, godfather, godmother uh, system where, where the orchestra adopts thousands of newborn babies. And 95% uh, of the second grade students, so eight year old uh, kids go to concert uh, once at least. So they are familiarized with that, they're exposed to, to classical music, to organized. Um, or to, to, um, to orchestra playing. So the organization of the whole education um, a chain. Um, the music schools, as we have in all the Nordic countries, I just checked, the, the Finland has 97 music schools. In France, proportionally, that would mean 10 times more if proportionally compared to the population, that would mean 1,000 music schools. It's cheap, the teachers are high quality. Um, it's open to everybody. Of course, there are di uh, differences between different backgrounds of families, as Marion uh, uh, told. Uh, it seems to be that certain uh, people send more eagerly people to musical education than the others, but it's available, and that's the, that's the most important point. Then when we come to the professional education, now I come, Eric, to your question about um, Esa Pekka Saarinen and Magnus Lindberg. Um, there is a, a Sibelius Academy has a, a department called the Youth Department, one good friend of mine, pianist, started his school when he was five years old, for family reasons. Uh, Esa Pekka and Magnus have both been in the youth department, which means that they have been exposed to the best possible tuition from a very, very early age. That's instrumental, mostly, the teaching, but you can even start conducting from a very early age. Just in Klaus Mäkelä and Mikko Franka, a good example of that, that uh, I think. Klaus even might have been studying that uh, in the youth department. Anyway, the excellence belongs to everybody, but excellence is exposed from the very, very early age to very talented people. So that's the kind of the, that, the other end of a certain kind of polarity of the, of the musical discourse. Now, when we go further, uh, then the, how people want to go uh, and uh, enjoy classical music. So you talked about the density. Of the, of the orchestras in Nordic countries. Finland has 30 orchestras who are part member, members of the organization which lobbies for the orchestras. Um, 30 orchestras, their budget in total, the cost is 82 million euros per year in year 19, which was the last normal year. Uh, and that they give 2,500 concerts on that time. And I think th th those numbers are proportionally the same in other Nordic countries. So the ecosystem on the, on the orchestral side, it doesn't cost a lot. That's my point. Again, 
the lessons to the for for our Mitchell Europa or uh, the Collège Français. Donc, uh, uh, th there is a there is a kind of large, big organized discourse which supports itself. Uh, end of this. End of end of my answer. Thank you. Uh, fascinating. Just to put some more figures. So thank you so much. So in France, I mean, it will be another figure for sure in German speaking countries. But we instead of having a thousand schools, which would be let's say the benchmark, if we had the same level of um, engagement commitment um, as it is the case in in Finland, we have 100, 100, 140, 140 so called conservatoires. Rayonnement départemental or régional, and we have, of course, the uh, Conservatoire National uh, in Paris and another one uh, um, uh, since uh, 1994, 2000 in, in Lyon or 1985 in Lyon. So, two, two national conservatories and 140 schools. So, this is um, um, slightly less than that the thousands. And in any case, we also have no more than 30 orchestras, for instance, in France. This is still less in, in the UK, but of course, 130 in, in, in Germany. Um, so that explains a lot. Thanks, thanks so much. So, in, in, Andrew, would you um, maybe fill, fill in? I mean, uh, everything has been, a lot have been already, already said, at least on the institutional side. We come later with Nikolai on the more free on some side. Um, you, you, you were comparing in a in a for me very striking picture um the success of the nordic music scene with the success of uh, minimalism and and modern design in the um in the uh, wider modernity in art and yeah. culture so is there is there something here you would say which 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 could explain from the very first principles why we could speak about the nordic valet yeah, I, I, if I may, just before that, Eric, I'd like to pick up on on uh, Toby's point and some other points made. I mean, this everything that's been said is, of course, very true. But where does it all come from? You know, we have to remember that Norway and Finland are, are became independent just over 100 years ago. And part of that process was music. You know, Edvard Grieg and Jon Sibelius were, were pivotal figures in those uh, moves towards independence. And when we talk about infrastructure, where, you know, you mentioned Essa Pekka and um, all the and Klaus Makala, these conductors, and Toppy mentions the Sibelius Academy. But the reason that Finland is producing so many conductors is because they're all conducting orchestras and there's one in their local town, you know. And there's composers, Britta Burstedon, Oti Tarkian, and these people talk about the fact that they write music because when they were in their mid teens, there was an orchestra there happy to play that music. That doesn't happen in a country where there's one orchestra for every 10 million people, as opposed to in Finland, well, you know, 30 orchestras for a population of 5 million. You just have to do the maths on that. 28 of those are outside Helsinki. Um, so I think that the engagement with music in the Nordic countries is far more deeply ingrained than uh, it's, it's very, very admirable funding um, would, would sort of let, lead you to believe. It, it, this is something that goes back to the post-war period. Um, it, it, it's connected to to the death of Sibelius in the, in the early 50s, to the realization in countries like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, that the one way, that, that the culture should be a part of the welfare state, that a network of libraries, of theaters, of symphony orchestras was a way to keep your population ingrained, engaged in the democratic process, as well as just uh, thinking about life and surviving in countries where the weather is often terrible. Um, and it has also uh, uh, always been such a more central part of life than it has been in Britain. And I think Scandinavians sometimes and Finns sometimes um, don't realise the extent to which this is the case. You know, the BBC runs six, uh, five symphony orchestras and a choir. They, they're never on television. They're on television for two weeks of the year when the proms are on in one building, which none of them actually have as their home, which is a lousy place to watch a concert if you have preconceived ideas about um, gold and red velvet. And it's also a lousy place to hear a concert live because the acoustics not great. 
Do you well, want a new war between France and Great Britain? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe <laughs> I cannot Nouvel broadcast this. <laughs> maybe Jean Nouvel could be persuaded one day to do some work in Britain because one thing that London <laughs> needs is a concert hall. So but you want a second war now? You're adding one we on the top. Have, we, we don't have a single good one, so we do need one good one. That would be nice. And and I should also say that you know uh, the, the the Danish um, ensembles, the Swedish ensembles, the, the I'm not quite sure about the Norwegian ensembles, but the Finnish. Radio Symphony Orchestra, these, these broadcast on television so people can see them. They can, people who watch Flow TV can come across them and uh, they reach, um, you know, in Denmark, there's a half hour classical music quiz broadcast before the Sunday night concert. This is a, this is, says something about what Denmark believes about the place of classical music in society. And um, yeah, I think it's connected deep in, in psyche. You know, Denmark and Sweden, have a lot, a much more kind of aristocratic, uh, long history and, uh, of empire and uh, significant world players centuries ago, unlike Finland and Norway. But they have, but they kind of joined in the in the 1950s and 60s with with this idea that if you make um, the kind of court music that had existed in those countries part of the social welfare system, then you will then it will kind of become a part of people's lives. And there's a word for this in Danish, uh, I think, danelse, which sort of suggests to engage with art, to engage with culture, to engage with music, which is about listening, of course, is fundamentally important for a, a, a democratic society. And, you know, listening is a skill which is not in short supply in Finland, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway, countries where, yes, train stations are often very quiet. All sorts of places are often very quiet, often because people are listening more than they are talking. Um, but uh, just to, also, there's one thing on the arm's length issue. I mean, we, we saw in Denmark, I don't know if Tatiana would agree with this, but and, and Nikolai, long before we were talking about um, underrepresentation from women, from uh, black and ethnic minority people, the, the government, the previous government was getting involved in, uh, in, in, in um, contravening the arm's length principle by, by suggesting what orchestras should play. And this was a very um, uh, un un-Scandinavian, undemocratic thing to see. And we're seeing a little less of it now, but still, uh, and it was coming from, ironically, from the far right. And these are parties who at least have in decided to engage with the content of what orchestras play rather than to decide that it's an economic issue. So there's still a sense in the Nordic countries that, that funding culture is good for its own sake, rather than insisting it has to be um, somehow justified in, in terms of a return on an investment, which is what we're seeing in, in Britain these days, that you can't fund culture unless you're seeing a, a, a beneficial return. Of course, it is great to see a, a, a return on the investment, but it's far better to have a conversation about art for the, for the sake of what it does. And the parties who have been talking about that are, um, for good or bad, the parties who most musicians would naturally disagree with because they come from the far right, but they've been saying we need more music from the golden age uh, in Denmark, we need less operas um, written now, we need, to, uh, we need to hear more operas from the sort of late 1800s, and, and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a very strange way of thinking, but at least it's, um, at, least, at least there is this discussion about the actual art, um, even if um, we would all disagree that the arm's length principle um, should be preserved. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. Oh, perfectly. We could only dream in the UK, France, and perhaps Germany that we have any kind of political discussion at that level on should we perform more late 18th century music or more early 21st century. I mean, I can can imagine this even coming close to anyone, even the lowest range staff member of any candidate in the uh, being uh, in the UK, a parliament has a Commons or to the French parliament. Um, that was great. That was amazing. Uh, Nikolai, are you part of that old aristocratic culture? And who was talking about these former courts in Copenhagen, Stockholm, uh, with uh, French and Spanish and Habsburg princes around? I think you still have a kind of French king in Copenhagen, if I'm right informed. <laughs> Um, or, or is concerto Copenhagen definitely unlinked to that aristocratic culture and has um, made the democratic move for a long time? Uh, joke aside, um, uh, how would you see this um, vibrant early music? I'm not mentioning the running poem, etc. In Scandinavia, all this wave of music from two, three, four centuries coming, being recorded 
uh, being performed that for three or four decades now uh, coming from Scandinavia uh, what is the which ingredients are there for for such an appeal yeah um it's it's interesting Eric your your take on it because I think we all um many of us in the Baroque business in the Nordic countries, we see ourselves as uh, latecomers actually, because uh, it all started in Central Europe and England and slowly developed into our countries. Um, the, you mentioned Do Dottingholm Baroque Ensemble, that, that was the first one we, we started uh, 10 years later. Um, I'm not sure about the Finnish Baroque Orchestra when they actually started, but it has been going on for a long time. But but it's all something that was inspired from what happened in Central Europe and then eventually moved up here. And actually, uh, we think it came very late, seen from our point of view, and I'm not only speaking for myself, from also from my colleague ensembles, we, uh, we, we don't feel it's an easy struggle because we are independent, we are not inserted into those um, uh, streams of money that we are speaking about. Um, what what we try to do is based on some, there is government funding, yes, but it's some special programs that you can apply for every year and things like that. It's not easy to attract sponsors because we don't reach huge audiences. Uh, we can, uh, we can do what we do through keeping a very, very high level, artistic level, to th through being uh, innovative all the time. We have to, we have always had to rethink our programs all the bloody time and to combine it into contemporary or folk music or jazz or whatever and, 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 and simply present something that is interesting for the audience because uh, otherwise we don't, don't exist. And then, um, of course, to be uh, innovative also in how we communicate it and, uh, and the kind of, of partners we try to attract. And then also networking. We, we, we are forced to, to network. We, we have established this new Nordic network of Baroque orchestras called the Nordic Baroque scene. We ourselves are members of the REMA that was actually born in France. And we have other kinds of network. We have to work together because otherwise we will be wiped out. And it's funny when we talk about um, the the power of of state subsidy. We are a little bit envious about the French uh, because you have a, a very strong support for for. I think it's very much on musician level and musician associations level because, for example, our French Baroque orchestra colleagues. Uh, we we see them having very good conditions for working, uh, very a lot of support from the French state. When I go to conferences in in France uh, about early music, I'm impressed with the support, the conditions, the frame they are given. So um, let's not um, forget that it's also very well done in other countries. If um, if I may. If, yeah, I may add, okay. if I may add there, also the admiration of France um, is very much linked to the social support. Um, yeah. uh, so the system called Intermittent Spectacle, which supports yeah. very well the freelance artists in general, and Conge Spectacle, that's, um, uh, that's kind of has been the pioneer for supporting. So Gloire de la France here. Yeah, which is not absolutely not the, the state. I mean, it's not based on, on, on taxes. It's, it's paid by practically everyone working in France who is contributing kind of gesture of solidarity to artists and technicians. So it's practically as if everyone was paying within a country, everyone working would be paying um, for having artists in, within the society. So that's, that's pretty much which is very variable. Regarding uh, support, this is another story um, I mean, uh, as you as you as you said, everything started um, in in a in triangle between between Prague, Vienna, Dresden, and moved to the Netherlands, and then arrived a little bit later even to the UK, France, and of course Scandinavia. But in the meantime, let's say the the the, the late comers have uh, well well surpassed the early the early beginners. 
um, and probably like you do feel, I'm quite certain French um, free music ensembles as well as the German and British ones do feel also jealous and envious of the most romantic classical and, and post-romantic institutions. Um, despite them being also also supported, uh, Nicolai, please tell us a little bit more about this Nordic Baroque scene, as I think it is a quite a new initiative, and you will have a first event next next spring. Actually, this year we the, there is um, the first event we are organizing is in Bode in the north of Norway um, in the end of June. I think it's 26th of June, which is a, a new format. Um, I mean, really world premiere format where we combine a music festival with emphasis on early music, but very also very much crossover and uh, a competition, a Baroque singers competition, a competition that is for singers who are specialized in this kind of singing. And the, the, the way we chose the candidates was very different from how that is normally done. So there will be playing concert, there will be workshops for, for um, young people in the area where, where they are, the idea is to combine some elements from jazz and from the early music and from the folk song. And there will be these competition workshops, so the meaning that those uh, who have entered the competition will actually be working with musicians from our four Baroque orchestras uh, to create these programs. And it's um, so it's it's, uh, it's a different kind of format. There will be uh, not only one prize, but one prize for each participant uh, in different areas. So we're trying to make something really different, and and we believe uh, Nordic in a certain way. And this could be followed on screen, or, or... yes, I think there is a quite extensive streaming going on because uh, Storm and the Culture House Storm in Bode is very well equipped. Uh, with all that stuff, so so that it, a plan of it's a plan to stream a lot of it indeed. Um, I have to find a power okay. supply. I can see my battery is running out. Can I just leave you a second, uh, Eric? Sure. I'm sorry. Sure, sure. So if we anyway come to kind of conclusive world. Um, the the one takeaway I would definitely uh, take with me the one by Andrew telling uh, uh, that Scandinavian Nordic societies are more about listening than talking and that makes plain also the, 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 the vibrancy of the scene. But I'm sure there are some other takeaways. So if you were a um, politician somewhere in, on, the, on the continent, uh, which, which uh, exclusive or unique um, um, measure would you take if there is only one, if you would recommend politicians to do one thing to a little bit improve their own musical environment, which one would it be? So one sentence, Tatiana, please. Yeah, I think it's uh, the, one of the most important things is to make uh, a good, a good healthy uh, financial uh, environment for, for the artist and then let them do what, uh, what they can do best. Uh, money, money and freedom. Money but, and freedom. Yeah, but freedom, freedom by freedom also by money. To be honest, because it, uh, okay. it 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 gives you so much more possibility to be experimental if you have some kind of security in it. Understood. Thanks, Mayan. Um. Yeah. Well, the same. I would say I have to <laughs> same <laughs> order of freedom and money. Yeah. The, well. Huh. Um, okay. I'm not sure, but I I, I would just like to to Please. modify this picture of of uh, Norway as a paradise for, for <laughs> art. I mean, I, <laughs> the, the, it goes with the story that, um, yeah, well, artists and, and art and music doesn't have a very high status in Norway. Like, we are sports people. I mean, we take gold medals in, in winter Olympics. <laughs> And that's that's what we uh, identify ourselves with. So, yeah, so art and music is more like, yeah, well, you can keep going in your own little corner. <laughs> it's, uh, so, yeah, that's I the, point. So I the point. I think France has uh, something to teach us there. I see the point. OK, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Frederick. Yeah, it's basically the same money and freedom is, of course, important. <laughs> and 
even though we don't take as many gold medals as Norway, we, I think also sports is, uh, is more valued in, in Sweden than, than the arts. And that is, uh, I'm, I, I, like, I love sports, uh, but, but uh, it's a pity that, that even though uh, the arts are very well funded and supported in, in Sweden, it is sort of, a, as, as Marion said, it, it, it's something that is put aside a little bit. Put, put, put them in the corner and if they just don't shout, give them some mm. money and, and let them be. Mm. And that, that is, of course, um, that's a pity, I think. Mm. But I think for, for, for politicians everywhere in the world, it's, I mean, it's a benefit to support the arts. The money always comes back in another way. Mm. You mentioned that, that, I mean, just one today when, when things are happening in Ukraine, I was thinking about this, that uh, it's not more than 100 years ago that, that uh, uh, Finland and Norway got, got um, their independence. And it was actually from, <laughs> sort of from us also. <laughs> uh, but I think it would, for any one of us here today, it is impossible to think that any of our countries should go to war against each other again. I mean, we have been to war for decades, uh, centuries, way back. But today, it would not be possible at all for us to think of being in war with Norway, Denmark, or Finland. And I think also this is, I mean, the, it's a part of the democratic stu structure of the society that we have arts, that, that we have this education and arts, and that it's supported by the, by the, 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 the government or the, the, the state's uh, funding. So okay. I don't know if that made any sense, but- Perfect, but. perfect. To contextualize for our audience, we are recording now that show a couple of uh, 30, 30 hours after Mr. Putin sent the Russian army into the Ukrainian nation. Um, Poppy. So my sentence would be for politicians, uh, the arts is a basic human value and it makes life better. And we also need sometimes to beat Sweden in ice hockey. <laughs> well, great, thank you. Andrew? Uh, yeah, I mean, money is obviously important, but just to be different, I would say, I, from my own experience, the transformative uh, uh, thing has been architecture. And Marion, you know, I, I hear you, and, and I, I know that Norway is, 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 is completely sports obsessed, but you go to Oslo, you see a brand new, museum a brand new library a brand new opera house next to each other they dominate the city center you go to Copenhagen you see an opera house that dominates the waterfront maybe in Stockholm in a few years you'll see an opera house that dominates a new development in the by the city there you go to Stavanger you go to Bodo you go to these other places you see the you see an incredible concert hall that is just unlike anything we in Britain have ever seen so I think that the one way and it's just one way and it may be seen as quite an elitist way, but one way to transform and to introduce, transform people's relationship to classical music, to bring new people to it and to, and to transform its role in society is to think how it integrates with town planning and with bold new architectural projects. We've seen this in Helsinki. We've seen it in Copenhagen. You know in Paris because you have three new concert halls built within the last 10 years. Um, so I would say that um, one way to, to, to really think about capitalizing on what the Nordic region has shown us is to think about architecture. Understood. Thank you. Nikolai, you have got the final cadenza. I, I think it's so important that we see um, the arts and culture as an investment in the well-being of, of people, of humankind, and uplifting for the soul instead of something that we maybe have money for uh, in the end. It's, it's simply, it has to be turned over completely. And there is some presence of that in the Nordic region, but it's also falling a little bit apart. So let's be very aware. Thanks, thanks so much. We've been as precise and timely precise like uh, Danish design or, or Swedish uh, furniture. Thanks so much to all of you. And uh, we go back to uh, the Centre National in Paris and Francoise, thanks so much. Thank you very much to all of you. That has been a, a fascinating discussion. I think this, this country has a richness um, and comparing the models is really, really fascinating. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, we can be in touch anytime if we can 
continue this conversation and, and put you in touch with some of our dear artists. That would be amazing. Thank you very much to you, Eric, and uh, see you again soon. Bye. Bye.